so uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, I really um, have uh, I've done some speaking work with uh, Medicine Pharma, um, otherwise no other relevant conflicts of interest to declare. And, and these are my disclosures. Uh, this conference, uh, this is referring to the annual meeting, uh, has received financial support from Alexion, Bayer, Leo Pharma, BMS Pfizer Alliance, Pfizer Injectables, Sanofi and Servier in the form of conference grants uh, with potential conflicts of interest um, uh, as listed below. And then mitigating for potential bias, the content of this program was developed by the planning committee and peer reviewed by Thrombosis Canada. Recommendations involving clinical medicine are based on evidence that is accepted within the profession and all scientific research referred to, reported, or used in the program in support of or justification of patient care recommendations conforms to the generally accepted standards. Uh, so these cases uh, were developed by Julia Bayadinova, who is a, a nurse practitioner uh, in thrombosis at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton. Uh, and uh, I um, maybe I can ask for a volunteer to to be to read the case out. Um, any volunteers? Um, I can do the first one if that's helpful. Seventy-six year old woman River Rock spend twenty milligrams a day for atrial fibrillation. She has two six, 65 is two. Having a colonoscopy with a positive fit. She calls you for advice uh, because her booklet, of course, says stop all blood thinners for holds one week before the procedure. Uh, what are the landmark trials? What are the safety considerations? What are your recommendations? What do you want to teach? Great, thank you. So uh, let's talk about the, the first question here. Um, really, um, there are three main um, clinical studies that uh, would anchor the recommendations around this clinical case. Um, uh, the PAUSE study, um, which was a prospective cohort study um, from the um, uh, from JAMA Internal Medicine um, uh, two or three years ago. Um, uh, the BRIDGE study, which was a randomized controlled trial from New England Journal of Medicine, uh, I think it was published in about 2017. And the third one is uh, PERIOP2, which is a, a recent randomized trial, trial published uh, this year in the British Medical Journal. Um, uh, I guess uh, maybe we can start, I don't have any particular, I mean, I do have slides about this topic, but really um, uh, I wonder if we should just discuss, are, are you all familiar with the, with the study? I'm, I'm happy to talk more in depth about the studies if you'd like. Um, uh, what, what's your preference about this? I mean, Mark, perhaps what I could do is um, I, I can present just like a, a very brief, would that be helpful if I presented a very brief summary of these studies? Uh, and then we can just apply it to our case. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do some Zoom magic and share another presentation here. And uh, okay, so um, this is a, a. Let me see if I can find the right slides here. So um, this is the pause study. So the pause study um, was a prospective cohort where they looked at standardized interruption intervals for patients who are on direct oral anticoagulants. So you've got dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban. At the time of the study, patients on edoxaban were not included. So the key, inter the key things to keep in mind here are, uh, what is the bleeding risk of the procedure? And secondly, what is the patient's renal function based on Cockroft, bulk creatinine clearance? Um, let's take a step back and look at how they defined um, different bleeding risk procedures. Uh, I've got a table here. Here we go. So um, this is an example of uh, the stratification that was used for really we'll focus on high bleeding risk and low bleeding risk procedures. So for high bleeding risk procedures, we're talking about cancer surgery, orthopedic surgery, um, uh, urologic procedures, uh, cardiac or spinal, and, and down the list here, including kidney biopsy, notably. Uh, and then low, low bleeding risk would be things that are still invasive, but not quite um, high bleeding risk. So this would be arthroscopic surgery, a lymph node biopsy, angiogram, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, 
a bronchoscopy, and, and importantly, in this patient, a colonoscopy plus or minus a biopsy. So um, this is the stratification that was used in this study. And then, you know, there are minimal bleeding risk procedures as well, which we would typically not interrupt anticoagulation for things like cataracts, for example, because, you know, avascular area in the eye, for example. So um, again, major anchoring around the bleeding risk of the procedure, high bleeding risk and low bleeding risk. So let's go back to this particular study now. So what they did in this study, and I apologize for all the back and forth, but they basically decided um, we've got um, X number of patients, I think it was about a thousand patients. And they said, if you're on this drug, if you've got a high bleeding risk or low bleeding risk procedure, you're gonna stop um, these drugs at these specific times, okay? So um, let's talk about uh, dabigatran first. So for dabigatran, if a patient, and this is before your procedure, so for dabigatran, if a patient was uh, had a creatinine clearance of greater than 50, and they're undergoing a high bleeding risk procedure, the interruption interval was was 48 hours. So that means they stopped it for the, for two for the full two days before, along with the morning of the procedure. If the patient was having a low bleeding risk procedure, it's a 24 hour interval instead of 48 hours. Okay. So that's the bigger trend. It's 48 hours or 24 hours. Um, that's for someone with normal renal function. Oops. Lower on the table, you'll see rivaroxaban and apixaban. So rivaroxaban and apixaban, regardless of the patient's uh, renal, renal function, as long as their current clearance is greater than 30, they looked at stopping at 48 hours for a high bleeding risk procedure or 24 hours for a low bleeding risk procedure, okay? So for Riva and Apixaban, it was the same interruption interval as for Dabigatran. The key difference was with Dabigatran, we know that Dabigatran is 80% renally cleared. So with the creatinine clearance of less than 50, the um, stoppage, uh, the interruption interval was actually doubled. So uh, for a high bleeding risk procedure, it was a full 96 hours. And I think this, this graph here, um, we've got, it actually says 72 hours, but it was actually 48 hours. It wasn't, it wasn't 72 hours, it was 48 hours. So again, the, the key message behind this study and, and, and the reason why I mentioned these intervals is that if you look at the Thrombosis Canada um, a perioperative tool for calculating dose interruptions, this is the, these are the intervals that they would use uh, in that particular study, in that tool. So that's what they did. Um, and then I'll talk about what they did afterwards. So, uh, you know, we often focus on the interruption part, but what do you do after the procedure? Well, it depends on what the bleeding risk of the procedure is. So if someone was undergoing a low bleeding risk procedure, as long as there are no issues with hemostasis, typically on post-operative day number one, they could resume their oral anticoagulation therapy. For someone with a high bleeding risk procedure, uh, you might wait till do or day two or day three, depending on, um, on, on surgical hemostasis. So again, um, it's day one or day two slash three, depending on, on, on the bleeding risk there, all right? And obviously nothing on the day of the procedure. Uh, any questions about the, the stoppage uh, algorithm that was used? I'm sorry to belabor this, but I think a lot of the, as I said, the tool really focuses on, on these, uh, on these uh, standardized interruption algorithms. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just move on to what the outcomes showed. So um, uh, firstly, uh, these were the, the numbers of patients that they had. So there were about 1,200 patients on a PICS, 600 were on dabigatran, and then also 1,000 patients or so on rivaroxaban. Um, mean CHAD score of two. Um, uh, many patients were actually on a lower dose of the direct, direct oral anticoagulant, um, but 33% underwent a high bleeding risk procedure. Uh, and what they found actually is when they followed them at 30 days, the really interesting thing about the study is that they did check in most patients a DOAC level at, right before their procedure actually. And they found with this interruption algorithm, most patients had a level that was very low. So less than uh, 50 nanograms per milliliter. And in many cases, it was less than 30 nanograms per milliliter, which is considered essentially undetectable um, or very, very low. So, um, you know, it's not standard of practice to measure DOAC levels before procedures. And I, I, I would not suggest that you do that actually, um, but this gives us a bit of confidence, at least pharmacologically, that there's very little residual anticoagulant effect if you follow these, um, these, uh, these dosage, um, this interruption algorithm. And then uh, what were the outcomes of this study? So I'll post them here um, on the right. Um, 
the main outcome is that it seemed to be safe and effective actually. So, you know, we always worry that in the, in the time interval in which we're holding the anticoagulation, could the patient have a stroke or systemic embolism? And the rates were far less than 1%, um, uh, in many cases, less than 0.5%. And then the major bleeding rates um, uh, were as, as presented here, which are similar to historical values actually um, uh, in perioperative studies. So, so that's the PAUSE study. And uh, I think when we get back to our case in a moment, uh, uh, certainly will bear relevance to the recommendations we provide for this patient. Are there any questions about this one? Mark, anything to add? And, and no, Eric, I think you explained it very well. In, in, um, there, if, if you really are into looking at the details of the study, uh, it, you probably notice that uh, two of these study arms, the Apix and Rivaroxaban, did not fulfill the uh, hypothesis that the upper bound of the major bleeding component would be less than 2%, the 95% confidence of it will cross, but just barely cross. And as Eric was pointing out, that although um, you know, the, the point estimate may not be as precise as one would like, the overall risk of major bleeding and, and stroke and systemic embolism is very low and very helpful uh, to give a uh, and when we're teaching or educating patient about the underlying risk of stopping and coagulate. So I completely agree. Uh, let's move on to the next, um, I guess, landmark trial that um, Julia Bayanova has had suggested we talk about, which is, uh, sorry, that's just the pause study. So I'm just gonna flip through these slides. Um, bridge. So bridge uh, isn't directly relevant to this case, but it's uh, uh, really in patients with AFib um, uh, who were on warfarin. So uh, in this study, it was a randomized trial, um, 1,800 patients with AFib with a mean CHAD score of 2.3. Of note, very few had a CHAD score of five or six. So that higher risk category, um, at least by the CHADS uh, score, uh, and 10% had a prior stroke. A few, a few key exceptions, uh, patients without mechan no mechanical valves, no recent stroke or TIA, and no um, cardiac, spinal, or, or intracranial surgery. Uh, these patients were randomized to two arms, uh, so um, uh, preoperatively, so preoperatively either placebo injections or bridging with daltaparin. So the bridging of daltaparin was a full therapeutic dose. It was 100 units per kilogram twice a day. Um, and, then, and then the daltaparin would have been resumed postoperatively as well. And really the question was, um, what are the differences in terms of stroke and systemic embolism and, and bleeding uh, in patients undergoing invasive procedures? Um, do they need to be bridged if they're on warfarin and you're interrupting it for the usual five days before they have their procedure? Um, and then just, uh, I'm leaving out lots of detail for time's sake, but these were the main outcomes here. So you can see in green, the bridging group. So this would have been patients who received daltaparin pre and post. The rate of stroke and systemic embolism, again, 0.3%. Major bleeding rate was 3%, 3.2%. The, brid the no bridging group, so the placebo group, again, similar rates of stroke and systemic embolism. So significant for non-inferiority. And also, the, there's the bleeding rate, 1.3%. So again, I'm probably not doing the study justice, but you can see here, we're not really seeing a benefit uh, in terms of the bridging. Uh, and then we are seeing harm. So there's uh, more bleeding, uh, particularly, I suspect the bleeding was happening probably postoperatively when patients obviously had had the procedure and were back on their anticoagulation therapy, bridging back to warfarin. Um, Mark, any uh, comments about the study that you wanted to add? No, I think it's perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any questions from, from the group about this particular study? Again, not really directly relevant to our case, but I think really a landmark trial. Uh, difficult to do a study like this, but really, I think that I think one of the main controversies from this study is what to do with that higher risk CHAD score, you know, five or six and also the mechanical valves, right? So, um, okay, so let's move on to the third one and then we can get back to our case. Um, so Periop2, so Periop2, um, this is a study that was just published this year 
And um, I haven't shown, I have to, I think I made these slides actually um, before the study was published, but um, in this study, they looked at uh, 1400 patients who had um, uh, traditional indications for, for bridging. So this would have been patients with AFib or patients who had a mechanical valve. Uh, and then I think in this slide, I really wanted to focus on the mechanical valve question because that was not in the, um, in, in, the, in the bridge study that we just talked about. So notable about this study, 304 patients had mechanical valves of whom 130 were mitral and then 172 were aortic valves. Um, uh, and of note, 33% um, of these patients with mechanical valves also had atrial fibrillation, which is another thromb thromboembolic risk factor as well. Um, uh, and, and these patients all received preoperative bridging with daltoparin. So they would have been on warfarin, warfarin held for five days, and then they received the bridging, the therapeutic daltoparin for, you know, starting usually on day on day minus three, day minus two, and then day, day minus one, they probably would have received a half or prophylactic dose 24 hours before. Um, a, few, a few key uh, exclusions, uh, a patient who had previous stroke would have been excluded if you had multiple mechanical valves, um, or again, spinal, cardiac, or, or neurosurgical procedures. And, and uh, these were the interventions. So um, really uh, the, the interesting thing about the study was the randomization was actually post-operative only. So everyone got pre-operative bridging and then really thinking about what's the bang for your buck is, is, is really um, you know, that stroke risk after the procedure, but also the bleeding risk, right? So um, half of the patients, we'll focus just on the mechanical valves here, of the patients uh, who had mechanical valves, um, uh, half of them didn't get post-op bridging and then the other half um, did. And then this was the post-op bridging protocol. So the other unique thing was if someone had a low bleeding risk procedure, they received therapeutic dose daltoparin afterwards. If they had a high bleeding risk, which was two thirds of patients actually, they received prophylactic daltoparin afterwards. So again, slightly different protocol, but same, same sort of idea. And these were the outcomes here. So. Again, in green is the bridging arm, and they found one stroke or systemic embolism and one major bleeding event. In the, in the group that did not receive bridging, uh, again, uh, no stroke or systemic embolism, and then three of them had a bleeding event, um, likely related to post-operative, um, well, you know, surgical hemostasis or, or the procedure itself. So again, uh, this study, I didn't present all the results of this study, but I really wanted to focus on the mechanical valve question, acknowledging that um, obviously, it's a subset of a, of a study, um, but we're, we're not going to get a study with this many mechanical valves probably for a long time. And I think it's a, it's a, it's interesting food for thought, right? Any particular questions or, or Mark, anything to add about the Periop 2 study? No, but I'm, I'm curious to see how you incorporate that in your clinical practice. Actually, I'm going to throw it back to the group. So um, uh, there are many of you who have perioperative experience, and maybe I can actually learn. I'd like to learn from what you have done. Uh, so what are what's the view on this study? So let's say you've got a patient with a, a newer generation aortic valve, mechanical aortic valve, who doesn't have atrial fibrillation or previous stroke. Have you have the group been bridging in general for these types of patients, or have have has the periop two study kind of compelled you to maybe not be so aggressive with bridging? And, and feel free to chime in because uh, you can probably tell I don't know that there's a right answer here. Um, uh, probably a lot of emotion tied into this, right? So, so Greg is saying that the, he would have from they would they would they would have been bridging this year, yeah. And I should add, well, um, feel free to put your comments in in the chat box too. I, I would say I, I, I've increasingly I have been doing the periop two thing where I've been bridging pre-op only and then post-op. Um, not bridging, uh, uh, but it, it, it is a bit emotional in the sense that uh, I think for a long time, the, the mantra was mechanical valve bridge. Um, I, I'm not right, quite ready to not bridge my patients who have mitral valves, um, uh, but that's, that's increasingly that's, that's been my practice for lower risk aortic valves. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure what you've been doing. I agree. I think I've been a bit more selective. So 
as you mentioned, I'm still a little bit reluctant, uh, especially with mitral valves, not to do any bridging. And we didn't go into uh, the data, but it's important to keep in mind that the periop 2 was stopped early because the bridge trial was published, and therefore they had troubles with recruitment. There was discrepancy in the randomization. They had a glitch, so that there's a little bit of um, different... Uh, there's some imbalance in the two groups. And, and when I looked at the one of the table, if I remember correctly, at the study outcome at the 30-day period, when they looked at major thromboembolism, although it was not statistically significant, it was close to being significant, um, uh, favoring bridging with a, a difference of 0.4 to 1.2. The absolute difference remains very small. But to me, that these are important features to keep in mind. And as you even greatly mentioned the, the underlying patient population of mechanical valve was relatively small and it although reassuring but relatively small so because of all these things I'm still a little bit reluctant so I haven't moved my practice into not bridging uh, all my valves but the, the lower risk valves as you mentioned I start to feel more comfortable but I think it's like anything in change in practice right we've been doing this for many many years so we need to start probably with the low risk patients and then see that it's working reasonably well and is safe and I think we'll move up slowly over time. Thanks so much. Really, really helpful to hear your insights about um, the limitations in the study to, in, in the study and also how that leaks into our clinical practice. Um, it's the big change to, to, to not bridge people with mechanical valves based on evidence that maybe um, has some limitations, right? So and it's a sign we're getting older because now sometimes the fellows or the residents in the clinic are so well based on periop two, we don't necessarily need to bridge. It. <laughs> so I need to be pushed. That's the that's the reason why we have learners in our clinic to push us a little bit. That's good. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. Okay, let's go back to our case, um, and then uh, we should move on to some of your questions. So um, here we go. Uh, we talked about, uh, I think we covered it, uh, pause, uh, periop 2 in bridge, uh, and then just to remind you all that uh, Thrombosis Canada does have a dosage, uh, sorry, an interruption um, calculator that helps you to determine what the, what the interruption interval would be um, uh, for these types of procedures. And uh, let's get back to our uh, I think I'm just going to skip. Ah, this is, uh, I think, relevant. So, um, you know, you're always, we're always balancing the thromboembolic risk um, with the procedural risk, creatinine clearance, and also any other reasons for patients to bleed, including incompetent NSAIDs or, or anti bleeder therapy or drugs that can prolong uh, uh, the half life of your direct oral anticoagulant. Okay. Um, I think this is the repeat slide. So, let's go back to this. So, Again, just to review, we set a 76-year-old female on rivaroxaban, 20 milligrams daily for AFib with a CHADS2 score of two. She's having a colonoscopy and um, uh, there's a high likelihood that she might actually need a biopsy because there's a positive FIT test and maybe there's a suspicion for a polyp. She calls you for advice. Um, do I need to stop her for a full week? Uh, and so uh, the process that you'd go through with a calculator would be um, online would be to calculate the patient's creatinine clearance, um, uh, um, sort of ascertain that because this is a colonoscopy plus or minus biopsy, this would be in that middle column, so a low bleeding risk procedure, um, but low to moderate procedural bleeding risk in the sense that if a biopsy is taken, um, then postoperatively, we really need to think about what's the patient's bleeding risk. So. Um, this is what uh, Julia has suggested, and in my clinical practice, this is what I do as well. So uh, as per the PAUSE study, we would also give the last dose of rivaroxaban uh, on day minus two. So if the procedure is on a Friday, the last dose is on Wednesday, nothing on the Thursday, and then the Friday they have the procedure. They don't receive any rivaroxaban the day of the procedure itself. Uh, on the day after the procedure, if no biopsies are taken, you can resume the rivaroxaban. And on day plus three, um, you can resume the rivaroxaban if, if polypectomy or biopsy is done. Um, Mark, is this what you would do as well? I mean, it's interesting. I had a conversation with the gastroenterologist um, yesterday, and he said, oh, uh, Eric, I've 
we we take biopsies on river oxybent all the time and we um they can resume it the next day but it, which was kind of surprising to me actually i think i think we're, we're we're probably on the call a bit biased with bleeding complications that we've seen over the years um but so this is in general what what i would do as well um but mark what do you think i i completely agree and and, and the gastroenterologist is right that it, it is probably okay to do biopsies but because we don't know what they'll find in there and what if they have to do a polypectomy or there's a sessile polyp? You, you want to be on the safe side and make sure you have three half-life away from the last dose of the product before they do it so they don't have to do the procedure again and, and uh, have to clean their gut again. So that it's, it's actually exactly what I do. Thanks. Uh, any comments from the group, variations in practice, questions about how we applied um, the, the pause study and some of the, um, you know, the data that we just discussed? I have a comment from uh, <clears throat> south of the border again. Um, I think if, if I insisted on essentially a one day uh, hold of uh, uh, either uh, Rivaroxaban or uh, Apixaban, to my GI colleagues often enough, uh, they would stop referring to me. I don't think in the last five years, I've had a single gastroenterologist who would feel comfortable with a 24 hour hold for colonoscopy um, with or without biopsy. So I don't know if it's an American phenomena. Uh, frequently I have to convince them for only a two day hold and not three day hold prior to a colonoscopy with, uh, with potential biopsy is this an American phenomena or um, any thoughts? It's a good point. I, the, the, the way I've convinced the anesthesiologist and, and other surgeons and gastroenterologists in my own center is to have a reflection about, this is all driven by the half-life, right? So if you think that, let's take red rocks and then half-life is about, let's say 10 hours, and, and if you hold it for, let's say that even if you take your tablet on the evening of pre-procedure day minus two, that will be 36 hours. You're well beyond the three half lives away from the last dose of the product. So technically, as, as we know from the pause study, the likelihood of any residual uh, DOAC uh, serum concentration is, is very low. And then the same thing with the anesthesiologist, you know, the, American site of regional anesthesia will say five half-lives away from the last dose of the product. So they're happy with half therapeutic dose of an oxaparin because the half-life is six hours on the morning of pre-op day minus one. So when you have a reflection with them, well, let's look at river oxaban and then let's look at 10 hour half-life and then your last dose will be probably in the morning of pre-op day minus three. This is way more than five half-lives away from the last. There's no way there's anything left over in there. And they seem to be, and again, it's a change in practice, right? These things are relatively new, so they need to start slowly, feel comfortable, do a few, they see it's going well. And then I think it's a, a slow transition. Now, other, other um, paradigms or guidelines, uh, as I recall, suggest a <clears throat> higher risk group. Uh, these tend to be lumped together in kind of no risk, low risk, high risk. Um, there are others with neurosurgery or, as I recall, ERCP, we have a huge pancreatic uh, center, ERCPs with stents uh, that, as I recall, require or recommend um, three-day hold potentially or a longer hold than for colonoscopy. Can you address uh, the inclusion here of neurosurgery into the same bucket as a colonoscopy? Yeah, it's, it's tricky when there's um, not as many numbers of patients who had neurosurgical procedures or neuroaxial anesthesia in the pause study. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't go over that, but I think uh, there were a minority of patients who, for example, had orthopedic surgery and had neuroaxial anesthesia. I think it was about 7% of patients in the study. So, so on the basis of that data, they didn't report um, a predominance of bleeding complications from in, in the pause study anyway. But this is a point of contention because um, if you look at, as Mark was mentioning, the ASRA guideline, um, which which specifies longer interruption algorithms than, than what we are saying here, um, there needs to be a bit of a push and pull and, 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 and an agreement about what a bit of a compromise. I think it's it's impossible to make recommendations in a vacuum if, if ultimately 
we're not the ones putting the needle in someone's back. So there needs to be a bit of a push and pull. I, I think um, I, 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 can, I, I tend to think of it as, um, I use the same logic as Mark has done um, in terms of trying to make that argument about shorter interruption algorithms. But I also think about, you know, if we really need to hold it for an extra day, it's probably fine. Um, if you look at the pause study, like you have patients who are not being bridged with anything uh, and the rates of thromboembolic complications were, were quite low as well. So. so in the very high risk patients, such as neurosurgical procedures, uh, perhaps uh, ERCP with stent type, is there any reason with someone with normal kidney function for a pixaban or rivaroxaban to hold more than 48 hours? Uh, I think the main indication would be if uh, if the surgeon uh, or the anesthetist wants it. If you look at the pharmacokinetic data, like you saw 98% of patients, uh, uh, sorry, 85 to 90% of patients had a level less than 30, um, and then 85% less than 50, which is, uh, you know, I think I think I, th I think that gives a lot of reassurance. Um, but you know, uh, Kylie, you had your hand up. Uh, what were you going to say? Well, we were right on the right topic, this neuraxial anesthesia. I find there's lots of conflict. Um, and just, yeah, I'm wondering additional evidence, but thanks for reviewing the pause study. And, and it's a slow process. I, I, I'm lucky in some ways, uh, Kelly, because there's Sam Schulman did a very similar study as the pause study, but only with the bigotran. It was called Periobdabi, is published in circulation. I want to say 2017, but if you look for Sam Schulman with the Bigotran, you'll find it. And, and it's the exact same protocol, but at the time, only the Bigotran was available. So he did a, a, a pause dabby type of thing and, and showed very reassuring data. He was a bit more aggressive with resuming anticoagulation with the Bigotran using a 75 milligram dose in the post-operative period. Um, but he, he the, the, the results, again, were very, very reassuring. So because my anesthesiologist uh, did the, the Sam Schulman study, then they did the pause study, now they feel comfortable with that and, and they use the algorithm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it didn't have to meet with them on a Q6 months basis, because whenever they would go to a conference, they would come back and say, oh, we're not doing things in the right way with these DOACs. So I think it's just opening up the discussion with them on a regular basis. Uh, and, and they're usually good. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I'll open up to the floor. Uh, what other questions did you all have um, for today? I can go first, just an area of uh, challenge with extended duration of DVT prophylaxis co off but I don't know if you, know, you guys probably have experienced in that as well, though I hear that wasn't what the case was today. Um, there's a discrepancy in our group, those of us who practice in Eastern Canada versus UBC. UBC, we aren't using the Capri study very much um, with Zach Schwartz and the team to do extended DVT prophylaxis for high-risk patients with higher risk of the pre scores, eights, nines, and those kinds of things. Um, and I would just love to kind of hear what's happening across Canada or, you know, any research that's going on or any thoughts on, you know, extended duration DVD prophylaxis. And is it specifically post-surgery or for uh, hospitalized patients? Yeah. Um, yeah, focusing on non-cancer, non-cancer surgery, post-hospitalized patients. So hip surgeries, well, hips and knees are, are the right example, but let's say I've had gentlemen with soldier, shoulder surgeries that have, are older and have had DVTs provoked in the past. Um, and the, the question always comes up, well, do they need extended DVT prophylaxis for a shoulder surgery? Right, right, right. Eric, what do you do? I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Was it was this this is for non non cancer surgery? Non cancer that... surgery, non hip and knees, just everything else. Yeah, I see. So um, a, a wide diversity. Um, I hate to admit it. At our hospital, we don't really have a standardized way of going about this, and part of the reason is because um, we don't have a thrombosis program or service. Um, I would say in general, we haven't been using the Caprini score to dictate or, or to help inform um, explicitly decisions about post-discharge prophylaxis um, uh, for, for different types of surgeries. Um, 
uh, I do think that some of the components, I'm just looking at the score now, there are some components that I think implicitly that we look at. Um, but in general, we have been limiting our use of extended uh, uh, prophylaxis post discharge to specific, um, you know, things. Um, and it's the things that you would, you know, you probably have seen before. So it's like, you know, our 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 our, our cancer abdominal patients, uh, patients who have had bariatric surgery, um, uh, uh, patients who have uh, had orthopedic surgery. But you know, for 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 things like, um, you know, if someone's coming in for um, I don't know, uh, a hysterectomy uh, for heavy men. Well, and I'll try to pick, think of another example. I think bottom line is we don't we don't routinely implement a risk score to make that decision, but often it's individualized. Um, and then I think I think um, that's probably the best answer I can give, which doesn't really answer your question, unfortunately. Mark, I don't know if you have a more eloquent answer than that. Well, it's it, no. <laughs> so we also we also do a lot of case by case basis. But you know, if you think about the non hip, like if you think of, for example, in patients with um, lower limb fractures, for example, that are not hip and um, knee uh, total arthroplasty, there's also a big. It depends on the literature that you look for. If you go to France or in Europe, all these patients, the the walking wounded are all on trauma prophylaxis and you come to Canada or North America, a large majority of them are not. And so there's clinical liquid poison. It's based on the fact that what's the threshold of VTE you're ready to assume. And uh, so I have a discussion with the patient and it's on a case by case decision. Like the, the patients that you mentioned that had previous had VTEs and stuff like that, they're usually uh, quite uh, aware of the signs symptoms are usually a little scared of having a recurrent event, then they would uh, probably be going for some form of thrombo prophylaxis in that particular setting. If you're interested in knowing what type of agent you would use, there's a recent uh, randomized control trial data that was done in, in, in Europe comparing RIV-10 and an OX and seems to, for that particular setting, uh, RIV seems to be a bit more effective and, and associated with less bleeding. But that study is interesting because it's highlighting that the absolute difference between, like the event rates is so small that, um, you know, it, it depends on your threshold, your personal threshold to make that treatment decision. So I don't think there's a, a as Eric mentioned, I don't think there's a particular uh, risk predicting score that is uh, better than another. Often just your own clinical gestalt is good. And, and you could use uh, a 10 day period, which would probably be reasonable in that particular case, assuming that they had surgery and they recovered well, they're no longer immobilized or tailor it based on what you expect the degree of immobility will be. There's so much variation from one to the other. And I, I've highlighted, uh, uh, Kylie, the, uh, the article that we talked about with the bigger trend in the chat. And I'll find the other article in the New England. I'll put that for you too. Super helpful. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'll also add, uh, uh, Greg is saying, uh, we're similar, similar, not using Caprini, um, would likely fall to GIM um, hospital service to make a decision about holding up the study. So, um, and I think that's the case, probably. Um, it often, uh, you know, most, most places are not lucky to have um, someone like Dr. Carrier running around uh, deciding on thromboprophylaxis for them. Uh, so uh, we have to make our best, um, our best guess. So, uh, and, and yes, uh, thanks Mark for sending these articles, this is fantastic. Um, other questions um, from the group? I know this is uh, related or not, but um, is your group or uh, the two thought leaders there ever recommending a DOAC for an acute DVT in an end-stage renal patient? Go ahead, Eric. Um, I have not, but I know some people are. Um, uh, if I was pushed to and I really had to, there's a compelling reason to, I probably would, but it's not my first choice. I don't think we have enough evidence yet um, specific to VTE. Uh, there is accumulating evidence in AFib. Uh, and so I think uh, from a safety perspective, um, if I really had to, I, I would, but I think it's a controversial question. Mark, are you starting to do that? No, and, and it's, it's Jeff, it's a little bit different 
uh, nor to the border because our product monograph doesn't support it and would not recommend it below a cretin clearance of 30 or 25 if you're if you want to be specific with a pixaban and um, we're a little bit hesitant to do so because if you look at the PKPD studies, we're talking about hemodialysis patients, and you're looking at, let's say, a Pixaban, because in the US, the product monograph does not discriminate based on renal function. If you look at short term, so patients on hemodialysis receiving 2.5 BID, for example, for uh, seven to eight days, and you look at the levels, patients that are on hemodialysis, their levels is no different than those that have normal renal function. But as soon as you look at five BID and you do the seven to eight days, then the PKPD are four times higher. Now, in the large databases from the US as published in the circulation for atrial fibrillation, this did not correlate to major bleeding, but it's large database. So there's reasons why physicians decided to randomize a pay or start a, a DOAC versus vitamin K antagonist. But the reason why I'm saying this is in the setting of VTE, the initial portion, we're using 10 milligrams BID for seven days. And for RIV, it's 15 BID for 21 days. So who knows where that level would be? So based on that, I'm a little bit reluctant. And the only randomized control trial comparing warfarin to a pixaban in, a, in hemodialysis patient, in patients with atrial fibrillation was stopped early because of poor recruitment. And the curves were not going in the right direction. Now, I haven't seen it published in full paper, but the, I think it was presented at AHA last year. The abstract was, uh, you know, it still reassuring numbers, but the curves were not going in the right way. So I'm a little bit reluctant, but it's done all the time. Can I ask one more question? It's kind of the flip side of the coin. Um, there was a fascinating lecture in the ISTH uh, website by a German uh, professor about this kind of issue of, of renal function and DOACs. And what was new to me, and probably won't be new to you, but I'm interested in, in your thoughts, is that for patients who are not in stage renal disease, um, um, warfarin may have a deleterious effect on renal function due to various possible mechanisms, and that there's a push that DOACs may be safer in the creatinine clearance between whatever, 15 and 50 in terms of kidney health um, as opposed to warfarin so that maybe I'm using way too much warfarin um, uh, under 30 uh, ml per minute. That whole concept was fascinating, new to me. Any thoughts about the clinical relevance of that at this time? It's, it's a fascinating concept because if you think about it, there's no real data that has compared warfarin to nothing in that setting. And, and there's a lot of indirect evidence saying that maybe anticoagulation in AFib patients on hemodialysis is hardening them. And it, it's, the risk-benefit ratio may be very different than in, in the normal kidney function. So there's actually a trial randomizing patients with new diagnosis of AFib or prevalent AFib to uh, a pixaban, warfarin, or nothing. And I think that will give us the question uh, if they can follow patients for long enough, they will give us some of the answers. Right now, you're right, it's, it's a black box. And uh, you, you know, if there's clinical equipoise to do nothing, it means that maybe the risk-benefit ratio is not as good as one would like to think. And I should add that I'm not sure if we're talking about the same study. Um, that study at, at St. Mike's, they actually yeah. chose a 5 BID, right? Um, yeah, so as opposed to 2.5. So um, uh, thanks so much, Jeff. Those are really great questions. Um, I should probably watch that lecture. Um, uh, Greg has a question, um, uh, I guess a scenario. There's a patient in the ED with acute cholecystitis or perforation, perforated appendix who's on therapeutic direct oral anticoagulation therapy. A few years ago with warfarin and mechanical valves, we might use octoplex or bariplex to get them through the OR. With the DOAC, what would you use? Uh, so I guess um, your question is in a patient who's uh, on a DOAC and um, needs uh, urgent surgery, um, do you give hemostatic? What do you give uh, for reversal or hemostatic therapy? Um, and uh, 
you know, I, I think uh, the question to me depends on a couple things. Um, when was their last dose of their DOAC? What's their kidney function? What's the bleeding risk of the procedure? Uh, and, um, and, and whether to give, um, you know, hemostatic therapy or not. Um, my usual practice, uh, you know, there is some evidence for the use of, uh, of well, it depends on the DOAC. So if it's, if the patient's on dabigatran, then, you know, go ahead and give um, uh, adaricizumab. Um, right. Uh, you can give adaricizumab, which is, uh, you know, the reversal agent for dabigatran. If it's a DOAC, um, you know, my, my usual practice, uh, if, if the, if the uh, DOAC has been given like my, my cutoff has typically been 24 hours. And if they're going for a major bleeding risk procedure, then I usually give, um, I, I say we use Octoplex. And, uh, and, and that's based on some observational data. Uh, not great, there isn't a randomized trial in this area. It's based on observational data that would suggest that this is probably effective. Um, although there is a signal that there is an increase for thromboembolic complications. Uh, so you do have to keep that in mind. Um, because after all, Octoplex is not, um, strictly speaking, an antidote for any of these drugs. It's a hemostatic agent. Um, and also we're limited by the fact that there's no comparator arm in these studies. So would the patient have done fine if you gave them nothing? Possibly. Um, but we're kind of limited by the fact that um, there's a bleeding risk, obviously, going to for an urgent procedure if the patient truly needs the procedure. So um, I guess the other option is to simply ask if the surgery can be deferred until it's safe. Um, but my, my, my usual practice has been to give uh, Octoplex if I'm in a situation like that where uh, I'm worried about therapeutic um, levels. I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit spoiled to be honest. Uh, at our site, we were one of, a, one of the few hospitals where we can actually get levels done very quickly, uh, which might actually in the end be cheaper if you think about the, the resource of it, but that's obviously not uh, a viable strategy uh, at the time being. Um, and then in terms of the dose of the octoplex, uh, it depends on the patient. Uh, uh, the standard dose that we typically give is 2,000 units. Uh, that's the, the, the most commonly reported dose in, uh, in, in these cohort studies uh, that I'm familiar with anyway. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure what your practice has been. Hey, about the same, Eric. Uh, as you mentioned, there's little data in the periop setting. We're extrapolating data from bleeding patients. There's no reversal agent for the NT10A, but we want to do something. Uh, we, uh, Sam is doing a, a study, a prospective cohort study, trying to uh, at least have a, a sense of the, if this is helping or not hemostasis, but there's no comparator, as you mentioned, so we're a little bit in the dark. But I do the same. I use PCC in that setting if the surgery cannot be delayed. We have a, a, a protocol in place in Ottawa where we would use a 25 to 50 units per kg uh, because remember, it needs to be a little bit more than what you do for warfarin in most cases, again, depending on when was the last tablet and other things, but it's part of a study. Um, uh, and then we're, we're collecting samples and we're going to do uh, trauma generation assays and other things. So hopefully it may help a little bit to see if there's an effect on that, but exactly what you've mentioned. That's really uh, great that you're drawing the uh, coagulation studies, the thrombo generation, that'll be helpful. Um, we have a few minutes left. Are there any other questions? Uh, I guess a comment from Greg as well. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we've been lucky recently large, with large body habitus, we've been able to use percutaneous tube placement and then wait out to temporize. Um, for sure, Very, uh, that's a great suggestion too. Lower bleeding risk procedure to, to get them through. Any other questions or, or uh, comments? Uh, Q Lee is asking, not directly pre-op topic, but what anticoagulant would you use in a patient post-bariatric surgery who has had a post-operative uh, BTD? So uh, I guess your question is, if the patient has had bariatric surgery, presumably a, a, you know, like a, let's say a gastric bypass procedure, like a roll y for example, and then uh, they've had an acute uh, VTE event, but they were not on anticoagulation before the surgery, I guess, is that right? Yeah, so my um, my usual uh, practice has been to use low molecular weight heparin um, uh, uh, out of the, the concern for the issues with uh, absorption. Um, you know, um, there is some not so great data looking at levels after bariatric surgery with DOACs and, 
and, and things. But the truth is, um, it's a it's a it's a VTE, and we need to make sure they have um, you know good therapeutic anticoagulation. Um, the other option would be to use low microheparin to bridge to warfarin, which you could certainly do as well. Um, you know, for for treatment duration, presumably of three months. Um, but that's that's what I would do. Uh, Q, is that what you have done, or has your practice varied? And maybe while Q is answering, Mark, you can comment as well. Sure, sure. I would have done the same thing. Um, there's, you know, as we mentioned before, we're concerned about levels and the setting of an acute VTE. The first month is critical for their underlying risk of recurrent events. You want to make sure to have nice and levels. Bad data, as you mentioned, show that maybe there's a decrease, especially with sleeve or ruin wide, especially with some of the DOACs. Uh, so I tend to avoid it and use low microwave heparin in that setting. And that would be consistent um, as well. If you want to read more about it, um, Q, there's, there's uh, the ISTH guidance on use of DOACs in obese patients also has a section on bariatric surgery that you, if you want to review the data, uh, there's a, a few paragraph on there and it's quite helpful. Where do you cap your dose for your Delta parent? And then say this patient still is 160 kilograms, 150 kilograms. I, I usually don't cap the dose. Um, I'll, I'll use twice daily dosing uh, in these situations, Bethany. Mark, do you have an upper limit or? I, I don't. Uh, I usually don't cap the dose either. And Bethany, there's a little bit of well, data, the data is not the best, but we're trying to do a data. There's a Canadian study uh, looking at no capping in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis where we do uh, uh, trough level after seven and 30 days. And we have patients from 90 kilograms to 180 kilograms or halfway through. Um, I can tell you there's no dose accumulation at seven and 30 days from the peak of the patients we have right now. So it seems like uh, no capping seems to be very reasonable in that setting. Up to 160 kilograms, I wouldn't lose sleep. If we're talking about 200, 210 kilograms, the severely obese, then I tend to, maybe tend to be a bit more mindful and, and maybe would do a level at some point just to reassure myself. Um, but I, it, just like Eric, I don't tend to cap at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I start to get uncomfortable above the 30,000. <laughs> Uh, and then last question is from uh, Dr. Ne uh, Bitch. Uh, have you seen excess bleeding with no capping? Um, I don't have a good academic answer for this. Um, anecdotally, I haven't. Uh, Mark, I, I, do you know any literature around this specific question? Or? Um, and no, there's a little bit of data from Rieti, but it's, um, as you know, it's a registry. So it's hypothesis generating for sure. Um, in that particular study, uh, uh, the wave study that I just referred to, um, we didn't. We don't seem to have a higher risk of bleeding than what we would expect in cancer patients. But Bethany, if you're interested, we do banding to use pre-filled syringes. If you're interested in knowing the banding we're using in that study, you can, can send me an email. I'll send you the uh, the weight and and what type of dose we're using in that in that patient population, if it's be helpful. <laughs> 